I'm thrilled to be here today because I get to talk about one of the Air Force's brightest lights and most controversial figures. This is an interesting guy. Um, what I want to talk about today uh, is it, this topic and this person touches on so many different facets of the Air Force story that we could go on for weeks, but I won't. Uh, what I intend to do is, is, is take a, a brief and breezy trip through Billy Mitchell's life and accomplishments and what he set out to do and what he achieved, what he didn't achieve, and then we'll watch Hollywood's interpretation in a particular 1950s Cold War early life of the Air Force context. So, but to back up just a second, I'm told you're always supposed to start these things with a joke. So here, here we go. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. We're glad you're here. <laughs> okay then, so joke's out of the way so we can get started. So, um, so as, as Jamie mentioned, I'm a curator in a museum and the Air Force's National Museum uh, is an enormous place. I urge you to come see us and bring comfortable shoes because it's 19 acres indoors of everything the Air Force has ever flown. Um, and, and so it's, it's a good walk. It's a, it's a full day's visit. And the perspective that, that I bring to this is not just a historian's perspective, but a material culture perspective as well, or the perspective of somebody who works with the big greasy machines and tries to figure them out and preserve them inside a museum. So that said, let's get started. So the Air Force in its History and Museums program makes a distinction between history and heritage. And it goes like this. History, we, we feel, is, is the foundation of all the things that, that we remember and that we celebrate through memory. It is the facts of what happened. What, what happened? Are, are there records? These are the records. These are the facts of what happened. Heritage, on the other hand, springs from the material of history. Heritage, in, in the Air Force's point of view, is the stories and the ideas and the lessons and importantly, the objects and the records and the landscapes that we preserve because we find them meaningful. And so uh, both of these things need to work together to be useful for the Air Force in both shaping the service's future and in understanding and appreciating its past. So again, we make that distinction between history and heritage, but they're interwoven together, they depend on one another, and uh, today's topic, Billy Mitchell, is of course both a history and heritage uh, topic because we know what happened, but figuring out what it means and assigning a place to the story, that's really what we're up to. So who is this guy? Who is Billy Mitchell? Well, uh, he was born in France to a wealthy family from Wisconsin, came back to Wisconsin as a small child. And uh, long story short, uh, he grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and dropped out of college in Washington, D.C. to enlist uh, in the Army during the Spanish-American War in 1898. He eventually, he found himself to like the army and he was a good soldier. He was a, he was a good organizer and a good leader. Uh, he found himself later in the Philippines and in Alaska, stringing telegraph lines across a great deal of Alaska. And so uh, he, he was a smart guy. He was well regarded by his commanders. And so he found himself at the Army's staff school by 1912. And that was kind of a, kind of a big deal. Fort Leavenworth School was, was where the thinkers of the Army went to learn their trade. And because Mitchell was in the Signal Corps, he began to get acquainted with things that fly. And 
aviation. It's where he first caught that, that kind of bug about, hmm, maybe these things that fly are important. Well, he was also assigned to the Army's general staff, also in 1912 in, in Washington, D.C. He was the only Signal Corps officer on the staff. And you can see in, in 1906, he had written a paper where some of his visionary thinking, now he wasn't the only person who thought this, but as a young officer, here's a young army officer writing a paper where he says, conflicts, no doubt, will be carried on in the future in the air, on the surface of the water, and under the earth in water. He was seeing more than army and navy. He was anticipating the development of uh, technology and warfare and so on, and knew that uh, even at that early age that the nature of national defense was going to change greatly in his lifetime. Well, fast forward to the First World War. 1917, things happened fast for young Mitchell in 1917. He was sent to France as an observer, and then, and then the, the U.S. joins the war, and he begins to take a, a very active part in organizing a really embryonic air service. I mean, they didn't have much to work with and they needed to grow and organize quickly. He was part of that. Uh, the base you see here is the great training base at Issedun in France. Mitchell was part of um, selecting the site and outfitting everything that ended up there. Um, we'll learn throughout the next 20 minutes or so that he didn't get along with his boss. Anybody ever experienced that? Well. This is a guy who had a hard time getting along with his boss. Um, one of his bosses was uh, a legendary airman by the name of Benny Falloy, who was really the polar opposite of Billy Mitchell. Benny Falloy, uh, uh, you know, uh, he, he was um, a cards and beer guy, whereas Mitchell was a highball and polo guy. Uh, they came from completely different backgrounds and had different approaches to things like command and discipline and so on. In 1918, things continued to happen uh, quickly for, for Billy Mitchell. He took command of uh, tactical air units and he served at the front. He led in the air. He was unafraid to fly over the front with his people, observing, directing, deciding, theorizing, and uh, putting his new ideas of how to manage airplanes in a war into practice. His greatest contribution to the First World War was his command of the uh, combined air forces of the United States and, and Great Britain and France in the St. Miel offensive in September of 1918. He commanded a combined force of almost 1,500 aircraft in a, in a pretty well orchestrated effort to use these things as a group, not in onesies or twosies, but en masse. And so he's developing ways to do things and he's carrying them out. He was a well-regarded commander, even though he was hard to get along with. At any rate, he, he uh, also organized air power to something of a lesser extent and in another offensive near the end of the war. But the result of his First World War experience was that he was famous. He was a well-regarded commander. He was decorated with a distinguished service cross. Um, he was made brigadier general and he was a public hero. Publicity becomes um, a critical part of this man's life. Uh, he's been called not, not only a hero and a martyr, but an abrasive publicity hound. Well, to, to an extent, all of these things are true because people are complicated and they can be both heroic and abrasive and a publicity hound, and far-sighted, and stubborn, 
all at the same time. Mitchell was one of those guys. By 1919, uh, you can see him just post-war here. He's, he's right in the middle. He was a confident and well-known hero. He spoke and wrote freely, advocating the establishment of an independent air force that would unite all of military and civilian aviation. His favorite topics included things like coastal defense, using airplanes, long-range strategic bombing. All of these things were favorite topics of his, and uh, he did a good deal to influence thinking within the air service. But at, again, at the same time, he was difficult to get along with. I'll talk more about that in a minute. As I said before, he, he led in the air. He actually participated in the things that, uh, that he advocated. In 1920, he was 40 years old already. Um, he had learned to fly at his own expense, by the way, was beginning in 1916. He was never the greatest stick and rudder guy in the world, but uh, he did take up flying, learned all about it, and earned his, uh, his military pilot rating. And he led in the air. You can see him here in his, uh, his one-star general's commander aircraft with the pennant flying from the back of it, signifying that that was the commander's aircraft. Well, 1920 is a crucial year because he observes the Navy experimenting with bombing a ship called USS Indiana. And he feels that the Navy's tests bombing the USS Indiana were rigged, uh, that, that they were kind of faked and, and unfair uh, because the Navy was setting out to, well, they, they bombed it with, with concrete and didn't really blow up the ship. But he, he observed this and he, he publicly said that the tests were, were dishonest. And so he was invited to prove otherwise. Well, this leads to those critical events of 1921. Um, and I'll, I'll start the film here in a second and, and then sort of comment on, on what we've seen. Um, Mitchell took command of uh, an organization of about 125 aircraft and 1,000 people at Langley Air Force Base, just north of us in Virginia, and participated in the famous battleship bombing trials of 1921. They were a creature of his own doing and his um, his planning and his publicity. So let's let's take a look at what those bombing trials actually really looked like. This film doesn't have any sound, but you'll see that uh, Mitchell's claims uh, are are illustrated well right in front of the public and in front of a lot of Navy people. Uh, he claimed that sea craft of all kinds up to and including the most modern battleships, can be destroyed easily by bombs dropped from aircraft. And further, the most effective means of destruction are bombs. He demonstrated, quote, beyond a doubt that given sufficient bombing planes, in short, an adequate air force, aircraft constitute a positive defense of our country against hostile invasion. This is where the former German battleship Ostfriesland is sunk, 67 miles off the Virginia Capes in 380 feet of water. Still there, of course, along with uh, some other ships that were sunk closer to here later on. Now, there was an official report of all this activity that shows up in the New York Times somehow. It wasn't supposed to, but it did. It caused a public sensation because in Mitchell's report, he raked everybody across the coals and claimed that expensive battleships can be easily sunk by cheap airplanes. 
And so why do we need to spend money on those things? The future of national defense is airplanes. So like I said, public sensation. Um, the chief of the air service wanted to discipline Billy Mitchell for going outside of the chain of command and somehow going straight to the New York Times with this, but the Secretary of War said, no, we can't discipline this guy, he's too popular. And so the chief of the air service resigned. Said, well, if, if, I can't, if I can't run my own ship, or run my own airplane, uh, then I'm, I'm just not gonna stick around. Um, he was unable to rein Mitchell in. What you're seeing here in the second part of the film is USS New Jersey and USS Virginia sunk close to us off the North Carolina coast uh, in 385 feet of water off Diamond Shoals, uh, which is uh, the site of those wrecks is about 18 miles southeast of Cape Hatteras. The airplanes that sunk those two ships, New Jersey and Virginia, uh, came both from Langley Air Force Base, which was... Or, Langley Field, which was 175 miles away, and also used a temporary strip down at Frisco, um, which we can visit later on. And the point of all that, the point of these second trials in 1923, is to prove that long distance operations were possible, that 175 miles, and that the, the mobility of air forces to be set up in a temporary spot and achieve their national defense objectives was a reasonable thing, that it could be done. Mitchell envisioned a triangle between Norfolk, Boston, and Chicago that contained most of the uh, um, industrial potential of the United States at the time and felt that airplanes were the best thing to be the first line of defense for that area. In other words, they could go far out to sea and deal with an attacking fleet before the Navy could. This made a lot of people uneasy and, and even angry. One of those bombs on this ship absolutely destroyed, it was a 1,100 pound bomb that just destroyed the ship. Um, and you'll see as, as the thing, it took a long time to sink. So we'll see that in a second and then and then move right on. Now the counter argument was that these battleships were not moving and they weren't shooting back. Well, that's true. Um, but nonetheless, seeing is believing. And the publicity angle of all this was that, look, the airplane sank the battleship more than once. And that is the story that made it to the press. Um, the Chicago Tribune made it simple with a cartoon. Here's the Navy saying, well, it's a, it's a defenseless target, it's, it's standing still, and see how long it took the airplanes to bomb this, it's, it's really, it's nothing to be worried about. And here are the airmen going, yes, but we did sink it. And so that's the takeaway that the public got, was that, yep, they sank the ships. So, 1923, 1924, uh, Mitchell is, all over the press, he's, he's famous, he's, he's going outside of his chain of command um, to, to garner publicity. And during this time, he writes some important theory things that, that influence the development of the air service. Um, he wrote a, a little manual called Notes on the Multimotored Bombardment Group, which foresaw, it was a far-sighted look into what air combat would be like in 20 years. Um, it anticipated a lot of things that really did come true in the Second World War. In 1924, he famously was sent on some inspection tours, kind of to get him out of the way, get him out of the press. Let's send this guy out to inspect bases and so on. Uh, he went on a trip to the Pacific 
and concluded that there was going to be eventually war with Japan, starting with an aerial attack on Hawaii. He foresaw that, he anticipated that, although he wasn't completely right. At the same time, he didn't think that aircraft carriers were ever going to be a thing. He thought it would be land-based aircraft that would attack Hawaii from a captured island. And he also had great faith in dirigibles, which was misplaced. Uh, but that's all hindsight. At the time, um, he had good reasons to believe what he did. He also continued to publish. Uh, he had a great relationship with the Hearst organization. So publications like Saturday Evening Post published fire-breathing articles about what Mitchell thought of air power and, more importantly, what he thought of the national administration of the national defense. Again, he's ruffling feathers. Well, I mentioned that there's a museum perspective to all this. Um, to digress just, just for a moment, uh, of the five things that all museums do, the Mitchell story is, is a good a good example for, for looking at these things. Mu all, all museums collect, preserve, interpret, display, and study the things that history has produced that support heritage. Um, preservation and that mindset is a key to any museum operation. And the Air Force's heritage approach supports its responsibility to maintain uh, these things and to tell the story. So in the case of Billy Mitchell, what we have at the National Museum at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton is a big exhibit, including a lot of things that Mitchell wore and his personal equipment, things he used, his ideas are explained, his decorations are displayed. And we also uh, had built for us an MB-2 bomber. There are no real MB-2s left. They're all gone. They've all been destroyed. And so ours is a reproduction. But seeing the three-dimensional reproduction built from original plans is a useful adjunct to the Mitchell story, and it helps explain the tools that he used and the points that he was trying to make. When he was doing all this battleship bombing, the bomber was still a slow, weak, wooden, fabric-covered biplane. And yet, and yet, here is a guy who foresaw skies filled with bombers being the first line of national defense. And we try to explain that uh, in our exhibit about it. Part of, uh, part of what we try to think about is not just um, history and heritage, but technology. How does this figure? The Air Force has always been a, a highly technologically oriented service. It's, it's all about the tools and what can we achieve with them. Well, technology has a broad definition. Um, it can be not only the tools that we make and use, but also knowledge and methods the ways that we do things. Uh, for example, the tools, of course, the bombs that they used, the bomber that delivered the bombs, the bomb sites that helped the airmen drop the bombs accurately, those are all tools, and some of those Mitchell worked on. The knowledge component of technology includes things like learning how to organize a highly technical force, or foresight like Mitchell's, the knowledge about how aviation would likely develop the knowledge component of technology. The methods component of technology included things like developing ways, formally written down ways, to apply air power to defense problems, the theorizing, uh, and demonstrating that kind of mobility with what happened here in 1923 off of Cape Hatteras, demonstrating the mobility and flexibility that air power brought to uh, national defense problems. That didn't work. There we go. So here's a, a quick look at the tools. The MB-2, an interesting airplane, and, and I'll try to be brief on this one. It was 
it was a big but slow airplane. Its top speed was just under 100 miles an hour, and it could carry about 3,000 pounds. It took an awful long time to get up to a suitable altitude for bombing. And uh, one of its features was that uh, it used two of the best engine that the U.S. produced in the First World War, the Liberty 12-cylinder engine. Um, and that engine is a whole different story we could go on for weeks about, but it's, that was a triumph of, of American uh, practice in the First World War. It was probably our greatest technological contribution to that war was that engine. Well, what about context? None of this happened in a vacuum. Time, place, people, and politics all played a role in what Mitchell was up to and what he accomplished and why he was controversial. He was always cheerleading for more air service, more people, more airplanes, better organization, and increased attention to the national defense. This is all happening at a time when the vast majority of the public is in a mood to disarm and isolate ourselves between our giant oceans and forget about European wars and get back to a normal life in the 1920s. As far as place, well, think of our place. Most people thought that the United States was safe geographically from any kind of attack. We just didn't need to worry about that at the moment. As for people, well, Mitchell's personality was, he was one of the, the key people involved in this argument. Um, now, to paint with too broad a brush, and, and Tom will give me exceptions on this, generally, airmen and theory, theorists, people who flew airplanes and made them and thought about them deeply, generally supported Mitchell's drive for, let's have a separate Air Force. That's a good idea. While people in leadership with the purse strings and people who had realistic expectations of what could be done politically and militarily, they generally opposed him because he was so outspoken and abrasive. They were more content to uh, go the long road, the long road of gradual development um, with, with realistic budgets and realistic expectations. Uh, as for politics, as, as Brent mentioned in the beginning, this was a guy who was more than willing to go outside of his chain of command straight to the newspapers and magazines to make his points. And he did. Uh, he did famously. That's part of, why he was, part of why he was so well known. He had a very wide readership in the press, and he endlessly hammered the idea that the national defense was being mismanaged, and in the bargain, manufacturers of airplanes were dragging their feet and profiteering. You can imagine all the people that that made mad. Well, he did ran a he ran afoul of a lot of people, including these people. There's uh, General Folloy on the far left there. That was his boss. There's General Pershing standing right next to him. He was everyone's boss. He ran afoul of him, too. Uh, General Pershing had a heavy, deep and real, uh, frank discussion with Mitchell about his insubordinate attitude. And Mitchell was cowed for a time, but eventually went back to his, his uh, press courting ways. Uh, Major General Menaher, who quit because he was not allowed to discipline Mitchell. He's there in the middle. And Brigadier General Mason Patrick, a guy who actually did control Billy Mitchell by sending him on inspection tours and keeping him off the front page. Eventually, Patrick came around to thinking much like Mitchell's and supporting his ideas, but he was such a good manager, uh, was General Patrick, that he was mostly able to control Mitchell until the last straw. That didn't work either. Here we go. Well, what, what is the last straw? Um, when General Mitchell's term as assistant chief of the Air Service expired, so many people inside the Army were upset with him that they lobbied for him not to be renewed. His, he had a four-year term as assistant chief 
And they said, Secretary Weeks, let's not renew this guy as Assistant Secretary. And he wasn't. He, he was not renewed, and he was sent to Texas to a much smaller, uh, much less visible job. And he was not uh, demoted or broken in rank. He was reduced in rank because that happened to just about everybody after the First World War. His general's rank was temporary. And so he reverted to the rank of colonel like a lot of people did. So what you'll see in the film later about where he disobeys orders, so they break him by demoting him, not true. That's not how it happened. His rank reverted um, as a matter of a bureaucratic practice. Now, he said, uh, Mitchell said that, um, well, you, you see the quote there. After a Navy airship crashed and 14 people were killed and some, some, na some other Navy aircraft were, were lost as well, Mitchell called in the reporters to his office in Texas, and he gave them a written statement which said in part, these accidents are the result of the incompetency, the criminal negligence, and the almost treasonable administration of the national defense by the Navy and war departments. And they all looked at each other, the reporters did, can we really print that? Yes, said Mitchell. Here's a written copy, print it. Mitchell intentionally, intentionally lit that fire because he was so committed to his vision and he knew what was the likely result of that. He knew that his superiors could not put up with any more of that, especially that kind of insubordinate language. Well, that all happened on September the 5th. 1925. Pretty soon, pretty soon the wheels began to turn. And President Coolidge himself energized eight charges of uh, insubordination in a court martial proceeding against Mitchell. Here's Mitchell arriving uh, with his spouse in Washington to be court martialed. He was always a dapper guy. He'd he, he, was, he was never underdressed. Um, Billy Mitchell was, he was, a, he was a stylish airman. Well, the charges were proffered against him uh, in October of 1925, and the Coolidge administration's calculation was something like this. A court-martial would force Mitchell out of the army but the army would not dismiss him and make him a martyr. He would be convicted at a court-martial proceeding and just be forced out, that he would get out on his own. Uh, spoiler, that's what happened. The court-martial took about seven weeks through the middle of December of 1925, and you'll see in the movie later that uh, the main issue was not what whether what Billy Mitchell said was true. The issue was, did he say it? Well, manifestly, he did say it. He was insubordinate, and he was convicted. Now, whether or not there was any merit to his charges about what he said about um, the administration of the national defense, that's a different question and was not part of the court-martial proceedings, although Mitchell made it part. They that's why the trial took so long. He made it part of the whole argument, even though that's not what the, what the judges considered in the final, in the final um, equation. While all this is going on, Congress is at work as well, devising a national aeronautical policy, addressing some of the deficiencies that Mitchell pointed out, because the administration wanted to be seen to be doing something about it because so many people were thinking, yeah, Mitchell's right, we're, we need to do something. So they, they did something, the so-called Moro board, and there's a lot more about that. But um, in the end, Mitchell resigns from the service. Uh, he was convicted at court-martial, was suspended from duty for five years with no pay, although that was commuted by the president himself to half pay, but he was suspended from duty for five years. Um, 
his ego, I suppose, could not accept that. And he resigned from the service in order to keep speaking publicly about what he so deeply believed about the role of airplanes and air power in the future of national defense. So books that uh, he had written before and since uh, were out there. Uh, a book called Winged Defense, which didn't sell very well, but it pretty much encapsulated a lot of what, what he had to say. A book called Skyways, which uh, is an old book, but worth a read. And speaking tours and magazine articles and so on. You can see a poster for a speaking tour right there in the middle. Uh, when Mitchell resigned from the Air Service, he moved to uh, Virginia as a, a big quotes around it, gentleman farmer. He thought about going into politics briefly uh, in Wisconsin, but that was only a, a brief idea. The, the ground wasn't fertile there, so he didn't do it. But he did support himself with lectures and writing on aeronautics. He was, of course, one of the few Americans who realized that World War I had not solved many problems. It had delayed them, but had not solved them. And he was one of the few people who saw that war was indeed on the horizon. This is in 1925-26. By the time the Depression comes along, Mitchell is hit hard financially, and he has to kind of survive by uh, publishing magazine articles and so on. And he was a guy who spent money. He had a lavish lifestyle and it had to be supported by other members of the family with money. Um, so th there was that aspect of the whole thing. And we're, we're getting towards the 1930s and the New Deal. He became a supporter of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and expected when Roosevelt won to be uh, welcomed back into government as maybe the chief of the new Air Force, or in a high administrative post having to do with air power. Well, that didn't happen. As you may know, FDR was a staunch Navy man, and he was on record already as opposing most of what Mitchell had to say. But he sure did benefit from Mitchell's campaigning for him. He accepted that help, but was in no mood to put Mitchell in his administration. Well, why not take a look at the man himself? I've spent some time talking about what he thought and what he said, but fortunately, some of this post-resignation vitriol was captured in a newsreel. So let's take a quick look at, at the man himself and what he had to say. There are and have been those in the United States who should be court-martialed for their deliberate suppression of our air power. Today, air power is the first line of defense of every country in the world. New York has no adequate air defense whatever. Today at Mitchell Field, Long Island, there are only two obsolete bombers and eight observation planes for the defense of the greatest metropolis in the world, dependent primarily on armies or upon navies. Armies can only entrench and hold land. Navies will be sunk during the first few weeks of war by air power. What determines the war today is the direct attack of the vital centers of an enemy, his water supplies, his means of obtaining food, his great cities, and everywhere where his people live and carry on their ordinary existence. Without air power, a nation is lost. And to keep air power under the army and the navy is the same as entrusting the development of a great electric light plant to an old candle factory. Now, in case you didn't get that Wisconsin accent at the very end, what he said was, ignoring air power is like entrusting the development of a great electric plant to an old candle factory. So that was, in a nutshell, that is Billy Mitchell's whole argument. We're ignoring air power, it's criminally negligent to do so, and I, Billy Mitchell, have the answer. And that was, that was his argument. Now, through a whole series of uh, complicated developments, after he left um, the Army, Army aviation continued to develop, but slowly. It got more organized, it got more people, it got more equipment, 
and eventually Mitchell's strident arguing from the outside tired almost all of the airmen in the army and he lost vocal support. He eventually was almost alone in, in, in this, kind of, this kind of complaining. And complaining was his superpower. He was a, a terrific complainer. But in the end, most airmen were satisfied with the, with the progress that uh, air power was making through things like General Headquarters Air Force and its trial period of two years to see if we can organize air power. They, they thought that that was really better than, than publicly arguing like Mitchell had done. And he found himself a kind of lone voice out there. So his legacy, Mitchell's legacy, um, it is possible to be both right and wrong at the same time. And in the case of Mitchell, being right in a spectacularly wrong way. This was a guy who was farsighted. He had some interesting ideas that did come true. He had other ideas that just didn't pan out. He, like I said, he didn't think aircraft carriers were ever going to be a thing. They were, and he had great faith in dirigibles, which was faith misplaced. However, he is lionized as a hero in the development of an independent Air Force, and rightly so. The Air Force embraces Billy Mitchell and his legacy, but does not embrace his insubordination. It's the man's ideas and his foresight that we celebrate. We do not celebrate insubordination. And that is why the Air Force, given the chance to reverse his court-martial conviction in 1955, uh, I'm sorry, that, that uh, wrong date on that, in 1958, given the chance to reverse it, the Secretary of the Air Force declined. Secretary of the Air Force said that Mitchell was bound to accept the consequences imposed by his service responsibilities. So despite being a founder of an independent Air Force, he was insubordinate and deserved what he got. Um, he's got a congressional gold medal, mind you, not a medal of honor, two different things. He's got a congressional gold medal awarded by Congress for his outstanding pioneer service and foresight in the field of military avi aviation, very well deserved. So with that, that's a, a hopefully brief enough uh, overview of who Mitchell was, what he had to say, and what the Air Force thinks of him now. He's one of our big heroes, but he's also a cautionary tale about how you should go about enacting change. Uh, and pending any questions you have, that's all I have for the moment. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming today, and I appreciate your attendance and attention. Thank you.